Okay, loading is going a little bit slow, but I, I, I want to make sure that we're respectful um, of the of, of Dr. Stein's uh, time tonight. So we're, we're likely going to have folks as we're as we're doing the intros joining us, and as always. Uh, we'll have time for questions. If you've got some questions that you've already got preloaded, you're welcome to put those in the chat. Uh, and as I tell folks, anything that's that's common sense and, and good decency, we'll ask for sure. Uh, and we should have at least 15 to 20 minutes for questions of Dr. Stein at the end. Um, but thank you for joining us for this special evening edition of the uh, Harris County Democratic Lawyers webinars that are continuing from March. Uh, they're not just for lawyers, obviously. Uh, our next event is set for February 4th with Dr. Cecilia Bali. What's the matter with Zapata County? Uh, Dr. Bali, who's a Rice PhD graduate, uh, has actually done research into more or less, you know, civic engagement among the Latino community and in particular voting. And she's done since this election, some in-depth research and interviews down in Hidalgo County, uh, as well as other areas on the Valley to kind of figure out how in the world did, did Trump's voting turnout with Latinos rise since 2016 uh, with the signal event of Zapata County for the first time in uh, well, my recollection, actually going Republican. And I think she'll have some great insights and an opportunity to explore uh, what's it, I, I wouldn't call it just an interesting, but a troubling uh, uh, issue that, that we as Democrats at least need to from among our many uh, yeah. be focused on. Uh, I also like to make sure, give an opportunity for Nick uh, Spencer, who's the president of the Texas Democratic Lawyers, uh, briefly to speak. But but before I kind of sign off and, and uh, ask Nick to visit with you a little bit, if you're interested in our past programs, all the videos are at the Facebook page. So John Dean, uh, all the different speakers we've had online, uh, whether you want to do it for, for CLA or just simply to learn what John Dean had to talk about the rise of authoritarianism in the United States, they're free on our Facebook page. Registration for lawyers and non-lawyers alike is $75. Uh, when, God willing, we're able to do a on, or I'm sorry, in-person luncheons, that gets you free lunch. So it's probably the best CLE deal for lawyers around, as well as just something that's a great opportunity for fellowship with fellow Democrats, lawyers, judges, and non-lawyers and non-judges alike. So Harold, if you can go ahead, uh, Nick Spencer is the president of the newly founded uh, Texas Democratic Lawyers. I'll let him visit with you a little bit about the opportunity to get involved with that organization. Uh, good evening and uh, you're in for a quite the show here. Um, as president of the Texas Democratic Lawyers Association, we spend an awful lot of time ensuring that this sort of information gets out to uh, the people so that you can understand um, uh, how important the work that we do is. A little bit about TDLA is we are a organization of chapters of, of Democratic Lawyers Associations. We are actively recruiting new chapters to be founded throughout the state so that we can ensure that the Texas Democratic Party has the sort of uh, legal and voter protection uh, framework behind it so we can ensure that we do great things here much like it was being done in Georgia. So um, I'm going to drop down in the chat some information for people who are interested in joining uh, the Texas Democratic Lawyers Association and um, founding chapters in various places. So please feel free to reach out to us. We're, get, we're doing a lot of exciting work and we'll be uh, delighted to have you on board. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Nick. Um, it's my distinct uh, opportunity because really this is Andrew Gass. As I think Dr. Stein pointed out, it was his persistence that led to uh, the ability to have this really timely uh, opportunity to hear from someone who's who's com committed so much time, energy, resources to figuring out, you know, why people are doing what's going on politically. Uh, and Andrew, as a result, is the one who's going to be able to give us a really outstanding introduction of Dr. Bob Stein. But I just want to thank him, the folks in the Braves Democrats, for all the hard work that they do in to, to make this party, make this county, make this city so great. And thank you, Andrew. And thanks for the opportunity to work with us today. Welcome, Democrats. I'm Andrew Goss, president of the Braze Oaks Democrats, and this is our first Zoom meeting of 2021. Isn't technology wonderful? It forces an old dog like me to learn some new tricks. Although we haven't been able to meet in person since last March, the Braze Oaks Democrats have not been idle. We worked extremely hard to turn out the vote for the momentous presidential election and the Biden-Harris victory. 
Uh, we dropped voter registration literature at almost 3,000 apartments in the Braze Oaks area. We then distributed 20,000 pieces of election literature to single family homes and apartments in our area. This project was overseen by our member, Alan Gutman, and supported by the Braze Oaks members and friends. We also conducted a very successful phone bank to get out the vote in the Braze Oaks area, which was spearheaded by our member, Gail Neeson. As you can imagine, it's also time to pay our annual dues for membership in the club. It's only $20 per year for a single member, and $35 per year for an entire family. You can't get a better buy than that. Of course, our club can only function with your financial support. So either please send checks made out to the Braze Oaks Democrats to my attention, and we're gonna be posting my post office box, or you can go to the website listed in the chat, which will allow you to pay by credit card through Act Blue which is a secure website. Unfortunately, we cannot rest on our laurels with the Texas legislative session currently taking place and state Republicans taking aim at our blue Texas cities and our voting rights. Next month, we're going to have a couple of local legislators to discuss the legislation that is going on in Austin at the present time. So we hope that you'll join us then. We meet on the fourth Monday of the month at 6.30. As an aside, I just wanna share with you that it's my understanding that the articles of impeachment have been presented by the House to the Senate. It's my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. or excuse me, Professor Robert Stein of Rice University. Better known as Bob, he is nationally known for his expertise in studying elections, their outcomes, and what we can learn from them. Um, he is someone that really knows what he's talking about, and we're very fortunate to have him tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Professor Stein. Thank you, Andy. Um, I am going to put up my PowerPoint, if everyone will bear with me. And I hope everyone can see it. Um, this is um, a sort of a lecture I've done before. Um, you can see the dates of revision. It was first done right after the election, not right after a month. Um, we weren't quite certain what happened and uh, why. Um, even by December, we weren't certain. And about, about a week and a half ago, I've been working uh, again to revise um, there are three parts to this <clears throat> lecture, I guess, and um, I hope I don't uh, wear my welcome. The first part is simply what happened. Excuse me, Mr. Stein, um, you're showing your uh, complete platform. Can you click on from the beginning, slideshow from the beginning? How's that? That's better. Thank you. Uh, okay. There are three parts to this. The first is simply um, what happened, what changed, what didn't. Part two um, tries to look at where the public is today, and particularly after the insurrection at the Capitol. Um, I should say in advance, I rely on a lot of survey data from the Pew Charitable Trust. It should be noted, um, if anyone bothers to look at my resume, uh, yes, I have been uh, financially supported. My research has been supported by the Pew Charitable Trust for many years. Um, they are not currently a supporter of my work. Most of my work now is supported by um, the Arnold Foundation, which many of you know is a local um, uh, philanthropic group, and also the National Science Foundation. But um, I have uh, contributed to many of the Pew surveys in the past. What I'm presenting to you tonight is work done by other people. Lastly, uh, uh, actually, there are two last parts. The third part is sort of how did we get here? That is, if things are so polarized, what's the origins of this polarization? Um, the, the takeaway there is that it, it's rooted in American politics and precedes um, not just the last five, 10, 15, or 20, but 30 and 40 and 50 years. And I'll finish up with what I think is um, historical precedence for what we're looking at today and what we might expect going forward on two dimensions, public policy 
and the 2022 elections. Um, it's a lot to cover and I'll be trying to go through it quickly. Um, keep your questions um, you know, ready and I'll be happy to hang in there as long as um, I, I can and however long your, your patience puts up with me. <clears throat> First, let's look at what actually happened. The results, I would argue, are very much a split decision. Yes, we gained the White House if you're a Democrat. But the Senate, um, up until the runoff elections, I do apologize. I like this table so much I didn't revise it. Now, of course, the Senate is 50-50 with our Vice President, Ms. Harris, holding the decisive seat. The Republicans actually picked up, now it looks like it, it is 12 new seats. Um, one House seat is vacant due to the death of a member uh, from Louisiana, but that likely will be a Republican. What's interesting here are the state legislative chambers and the governorships. There's virtually no change. But for the 12 seats in the House, this was what I will call a split decision election. Yes, it's consequential that the president of the United States was not reelected, but on par, this is an election where what we came in with and what we went out with was very much, I think, a fair statement to say a split decision. To me, the story of this election that is um, so interesting is look at what happened in previous elections. Usually in presidential year elections, 32, 64, I mean, you can look at every major presidential election and what you see is change. And this is the fewest changes in legislature, state legislature chambers since 1946, over 70 years, close to 75. So this argument before of a split decision is reinforced by what's going on in the state legislatures compared to what's happened over time. In fact, go back to 210, 212, 214, 16, 18. We went from 20 legislatures changing, 16, 12, 9, 6, 4. It almost was cut in half in every year. That tells you something about how disparate, how polarized, how evenly divided we are. The other part of the story is when the country is so evenly divided, this is the highest turnout election since 1900. And that I think, we just wanna pause and think about that for a second. 1900, 74% of registered voters showed up. I should say eligible over then 18, over uh, 21 and of course eligible to vote. But in 1900, half the population couldn't vote. And that of course were women. Another probably quarter, some think even more, men and women of color, particularly African-Americans and almost exclusively, um, uh, I would say Hispanics were simply not eligible to vote. Oh, they were legally eligible, but they were excluded, whether it was Jim Crow, racism, an absolute um, threat of their lives. So when you look at 66%, of the eligible voters, you're talking about an electorate that was vastly, not just larger, but vastly more diverse in 2020 than we ever saw before. And in fact, one has to go back probably to 1960, Nixon Johnson, Nixon Kennedy, um, to even get close to that 64, 66% we saw. I should note here that turnout rates were high in every demographic group, and particularly, again, among underrepresented Blacks, young people under 25, Hispanic populations that are historically likely not to vote because they're often um, not registered and very mobile. I'll talk also about um, some of the Hispanic vote later on. And the theory, the, the, the takeaway there is be careful what you wish for. When you increase voter turnout, you don't necessarily increase um, the number of people who vote the same way as those who had voted before, particularly in communities of color and particularly in Hispanic communities. This is the other astounding. It's, as much as things were stable in terms of the outcome, look at spending. This is just astronomical. Um, 208, 212, 216, there was a steady, and these are deflated dollars. Yes, I wanna be clear about that. I, I deflated them for inflation. Not that there's been much inflation. We're running about a barely one and a half, I don't think much more over 1.75 rates of inflation, um, if that. 
um, during these periods, A12 and 16. But we went up from 5.3 to 6.3 to 5, 6.5. But look what happened in 2020. And these are just presidential and congressional numbers. I don't have the numbers for the state and local races, but we went to close to $14 billion. We more than doubled what we spent on the presidential congressional election in 2020 over 216. Now you could say it was the Supreme Court's decisions which opened up the spending, but I will note here that the Supreme Court's decision even predates the 216 election. So clearly there's something going on between 16 and 20. And one might argue that when races become close, when they become competitive, parties, candidates, political interest groups, PACs make more investment. And this election saw a heavy, heavy investment. So given all of that, where do we stand as of the first of the year? Um, I'm gonna go through a lot of slides here and I, I, I will try to give you the takeaway. And yes, if anybody cares, I'll give my stack. Um, the most important thing about an election that I actually teach in my classes is elections are for losers. Now, what do I mean by that? Most and foremost, it is the losing candidate. It is the voters of the losing candidate who must believe in the legitimacy of the election for democracies to go forward. The most precious thing we have are voters' confidence in the elections being fair and being, uh, how can I say this, for losers, but for another day and another election. But research has shown significantly over years that supporters of the winning candidate in election consistently have more faith that the election was fair than the supporters of the losing candidate. And this is true for Democrats and for Republicans. When the party's fortunes flip in subsequent elections, people's answers flip too. They don't have confidence in the outcome of the election. And if this were a different outcome and the Democratic candidate Biden and Harris had lost, what I'm about to show you would just have flipped. And I have no doubt about that because I can show you data for previous elections that when you ask candidate, we ask voters who voted for Clinton, if this was a fair election, they don't believe it is. And by, by almost the same majorities. Trump supporters differ over everything. And I think this is important to know that there wasn't, it was virtually nothing that could bring these two partisan candidates and their supporters together. When you start looking at the percent of registered voters who say things are important, you can begin to see that except on maybe the economy um, and Supreme Court appointments, they saw a different world. Trump people thinking the economy was really strong, healthcare, these are the kinds of things that lead candidates to talk to what we call the echo chamber. Both Trump and Biden supporters say that if the other wins, it will result in lasting harm. The number here is among the Trump supporters and Biden supporters. Trump supporters, 89% said they would be very concerned about the country's direction if Biden was elected. And Biden supporters, by virtually the same percentage, were very concerned that the country's direction would lead to lasting harm to the US if Trump was elected. That is what I think tells you how the world is different and it continues to get, as I, I'll show in a moment, more polarized. Ironically, both parties and both partisans see the world as highly polarized. Among all voters, they see the uh, nation's partisan divisions increasing by better than two, two thirds. And Republicans a little bit more pessimistic about that than the Democrats. But again, the Democrats did win this election, and these are uh, polling uh, results from right after the election. Former Democrats and Republicans expect the relations between the parties to get better. And again, what you're seeing here is the effect of losing an election. I would predict that these numbers would have reversed themselves were the Democratic candidates um, in the losing category. Trump-Biden supporters say their candidates should address the concerns of all Americans. This probably is a good piece of news. Trump and Biden supporters feel that their candidates, their, losing, their, their opposing party candidates, should address all Americans. Of course, who are all Americans, I think, constitutes a very different definition for Trump and, uh, and Biden supporters. You see that converging in a moment. 
Republicans mention masks or mask wearing more often than Democrats when asked about COVID. Uh, it's just such a different world um, on something as simple as wearing a mask. Um, there's no question in my mind that this was a conscientious effort on the part of the president to essentially politicize something as simple as social distancing and wearing a mask. It worked. Everything was seen through the um, view of whether you were a Democrat or a Republican. And as a result, we're in the pickle we're in now where vaccines may not be available. Social distancing and masks are probably our best, best bet. And you can see how politicized that issue has become. Biden postal, oh, I'm sorry. This is now polls taken, if you can look at the bottom, since the insurrection at the Capitol. Biden's post-election conduct is viewed more positively among all voters and Trump's was declining. And you can see this in terms of conduct um, of the president and Biden. The differences here in the general population are large, but as you might expect, and, and let me say here, I'm gonna give you the majority. This is all voters, I'll show you the breakdown by party. Majority of party does not want Trump to remain a major political figure. And this clearly is coming into the calculations of people like um, now minority leader Mitch McConnell, McCarthy, at least some Republicans, both in the House and Senate, who would just assume that Trump fade away rather than remaining. That 29% um, does include, as I'll show you in a moment, most Republicans, but not all. And in fact, here's what you go for. Most Americans say that Trump bears at least some responsibility for violence at the U.S. Capitol. 52%, 23% some, only a quarter. So you can begin to see if you look at that 29%, yeah, they overlap together. The 29% shows up here who say that he doesn't bear any responsibility. But look at Republicans. Among 81%, Democrats say the president bears a lot of responsibility. Among Republicans and leading Republicans, only 18%, 34 say some, over, almost half say none. So again, what you see in the Republican Party is Trump still having a strong base. It's a base that by no means is where it was um, during the presidential election when he came you know, with 74 million votes to uh, Biden, I think 80, almost 82 million. You know, again, would it be better for the country if Trump were to be removed? And this was of course done just before the vote for impeachment. And again, you can see the stark partisan shift. 79% of Republicans or leading Republicans say he should remain in office, at least 83% out. After the Capitol riots, Republicans have some reservations about Trump, but most say incorrectly that he not only won the election, bears no responsibility for the violence at the Capitol, and should continue to be a major force. Look at these numbers. The total population, very different, but among Republicans and leading Republicans, 64%. Remember I said about losers, they think he won the election. 57% want him to stay in as a major political figure. And less than half, but darn close to half, think that um, his conduct since the election has been excellent or good and bears no responsibility for the violence. So what you've got here is a wounded Republican party, wounded by this, by, by this I mean, that they are still very much attached to former President Trump. And there's no doubt in my mind that he, as a Republican primary candidate for the nomination in 2024, would still be the leading candidate now. And my, my suspicions would be um, the favorite to get the nomination again. I will remind us Democrats um, who remember Adlai Stevenson that we've made that mistake before, um, twice. Nearly six in 10 Americans approve of how Biden's explained his policy. So in the early going, and again, these polls are from uh, right after the uh, January um, insurrection at the Capitol, you're getting you know, what I will call a better rate rating for Joe Biden than he did in the election. And I think that's important. Um, again, these are among all US adults, not necessarily people who voted in the election, but from the get-go, the president's had what I call at least the honeymoon that we often attribute to at least 100 days, however long that honeymoon might exist for, for, for Biden. 
Trump's job approval ratings have dropped sharply, and it's almost always or almost entirely among Republicans. So these are the approval ratings of the president starting in 17 through 2021. And you can begin to see that when he left office, he was at his lowest, 29. Um, this is the Pew. Gallup and others had him a little higher at 34. I've seen even Rasmussen at 40. Um, so that number probably has a little error around it of anywhere between plus or minus five and maybe more of a plus than a, la than a negative. But look at where the president finished up even among Republicans. Starting in 17, he was at, you know, historically high. 84 is pretty good. And he stayed that way, except during the 2018, right after the 218 election, where things went badly for Republicans in general. But he remained high through 2020. Of course, this dropped in the uh, aftermath of the pandemic. But since the election, he's dropped to 60% among um, Republicans in terms of favorable rating. That means that 40% of Republicans have a negative view of the president's job performance as he left office. Now, will that rebound? Will it remain that way? But it, what it basically means is if you translate job approval ratings, and it's a pretty good predictor of voting for a presidential candidate in a primary, Trump simply has what I would say at least a 40 and probably more likely 50, 55 percent handle on primary primary Republican voters. Um, and that's that's a lot. No change among Democrats. His high point was 11 after his election, um, but he has remained relatively flat um, in single digits. So again, the return of Trump is more about what happens in the Republican primary and Republican party than it does in the general electorate. This is a complicated table, but the best way to say it is one fourth of those who approved of Trump's job performance in August disapproved of, of it in January. That is the big drop here. Um, this is from a panel, same people being interviewed over time, so we can get a really good handle on if this is something meaningful, where did it, uh, excuse me, if this is meaningful, the overall drop in the electorate, the drop in Republicans from the 77 right after the election to almost a, a 17 point drop is in, enormous. It all came largely um, from Republicans, not Democrats. They were at 95, 97, and 95 percent disapproval. You can begin to see the problem for the president. Actually, it's not a problem for the president. It's more a problem for the Republican Party. The president may be a lodestone around the neck of Republicans. That is to say, they can't nominate anyone but Trump, but they may not be able to win with Trump come the general election, whether it's 2024 or as a, a stalwart and supporter of people in the 2022 election. I'll, I'll pause here briefly and say what we're looking at is, again, a highly polarized electorate. But what I'm going to argue and show you now is data over the last 25 years and show you what the origins of that were or are. These are surveys done as far back as 94, 2004, and 2014. Voters were asked in these surveys, and these are big samples, basically a series of policy questions that defined liberal and conservative. They range from questions on term limits to abortion, to same-sex marriage, to foreign policy for spending on uh, school aid, to um, student loans, to medical uh, assistance programs. And what we were able to do, or what Pew was able to do, is to define what the electorate looked like. And these three graphs should tell you that in 1994, which is a quarter century ago, this country was evenly divided between Democrat and Republicans. Republicans tend to be more consistently conservative and Democrats consistently more liberal, but there was a center. The center was peak and it overlapped. What was purple was where two thirds of the majority of Americans lie. What do you see happening between 1994 2004 and 2014 is that at center got smaller and smaller. And by 2014, 14, six years ago now, you had a big gap. More Republicans were consistently conservative, more Democrats consistently liberal. And that purple, that overlying area, 
began to shrink. And if you drew a line right across, you could begin to see that white gap. That's a problem. That's a problem for Americans. It's a problem for legislators at the state and federal level, because when you are in 1994, there are opportunities to find compromise. There are areas where consistently conservative and consistently liberal would find a middle ground. But when that gap opens up, it becomes difficult. Now let me show you how much worse it got during this period when you consider the politically engaged. As we all know, there are Americans who vote and there are Americans that don't vote. What Pew did was ask people how engaged they were. Their measurement of engagement wasn't just voting, but attention and, uh, and, and, and interest in politics, talking about politics, voting, encouraging other people to vote. Look at the top panel, look at the lower panel. The top panel are those who are politically engaged, what I call loosely the selectorate. There's an electorate and that's made up of those of us who can vote, but the selectorate, those who select our candidates, who select our office holders are in the upper panel. And between 94, 2004 and 2016, a, it's cavernous, a big wedge. In fact, if you look at the lower panel, the country, among all voters who are less engaged, widened very little. It's among the people that vote in primaries, that vote in elections for president midterm elections. It's where the gap got bigger. And if you're a candidate for public office, one thing is very true. You want to win elections and you want to win re-election. How do you win elections and re-elections? You get more votes than the other candidate, not rocket science. How do you get more votes than the other candidate? First, you get voting, voter support from people that vote, the upper panel. The lower panel doesn't matter. They may want to support you. They may tell you they'll vote for you, but because they're less engaged, they're less likely to vote. The upper panel, particularly by 214, tells you that Republicans don't dare talk to anyone about any issues that aren't consistently conservative and conversely Democrats. And that makes it extremely difficult. That purple overlapping area gets smaller and smaller. There are no one, in, there's not many people there to, to occupy that space. And uh, uh, US Senator um, Johnson, uh, excuse me, um, Portman from Ohio is your quintessential Republican in the purple area. He announced today he would not run for election. His explanation, I can't pass legislation. This gap is highly, I'll show you, highly correlated with the inability of Congress or any state legislature to pass laws. You simply can't, if we're that evenly divided and there's so little room of overlap, nothing gets done. Even in Texas, the state house of Texas only has a nine vote majority. Yeah, you can write rules to override that closeness, as the Republicans will do, and the Democrats will do the same. But the bottom line is you don't get consensus. The growing minority holds consistent ideological views. What do I mean by that? As we begin to see the single peakedness fall down, what we find is that the extremes, the consistently liberal, the consistently um, conservative, get to be bigger and bigger. The 49% in the middle drop to 39% and the tails of the distribution get bigger. In fact, this characterization of engaged voters is exactly what you had in the year 1860, leading up of course to the Civil War. The South and the North, you could call them blue and red, doesn't really matter. They couldn't find any center any agreement, any compromise on the issue, of course, of slavery. Here, the issues are a little bit more varied, but fundamentally, this partisan divide basically allows the, what I call minority ideologies, the tails of the distribution to dominate and make it very hard to do policy. Maybe the better way to do this is um, C. Frankel wrote a paper, and what he looked at was how did, 
he asked people, how do you feel about Democrats? And he asked Democrats that. And he asked Republicans, how do you feel about Republicans? And then he asked Republicans how they feel about Democrats and Democrats how they feel about Republicans. The feeling thermometer is on a scale of zero to 100, 100 is warm and zero is cold. How do you feel about people in your party and out of your party? The upper line from 1980 all the way to 2020 was a consistently, you know, I like Republicans, I like Democrats. But look what happened to the out party. That is, when you ask somebody, how do you feel about the other party? It's dropped almost 25 degrees. We don't tell them anything else. Just saying, how do you feel about a Democrat? How do you feel about a Republican? Asking that of a opposite party. That I think is a quintessential measure of how we have become so polarized. Out party hate has emerged as a stronger force than in party love. If you take the same numbers here and look at that, you know, over what I will call decades, it's going from 19 to 11 to negative 4.5. It's, it's, it's gotten frigid below zero. So what are the remedies for polarization? Before I get into it, I'm going to call my pronostication. David Mayhew, a political scientist at Yale, wrote a wonderful book called The Imprint of Congress. His argument is what we're seeing or what you've seen tonight is no different than what we've seen in American politics since the founding of the Republic. Um, he goes back to the 1850s and 70s when he talks about sectionalism, racial and class orientation. The progressive movement of the early 19th century, um, none of us were probably around for that, but um, just before the election of Teddy Roosevelt or his ascension to the presidency, um, what we were seeing was class warfare. Of course, we came out of the Civil War, Reconstruction, the 1950s and McCarthyism um, split this country and the 1960s and 70s over the Vietnam War, something that I think we all remember. And, and the level of violence and bombings and killings, um, not altogether different than what we're seeing now. In fact, I'd argue that um, eight, 19, 1870s in, into the turn of the century saw far more um, uh, violence than we're exhibiting in that, this period. So what does May you say was a resolution to these problems? Think about these acts, the Northwest Ordinance Act, the land grant colleges, the Highway Trust Fund, the Clean Water Act, the National Science Foundation. What do these acts all have in common? I will argue that they all followed major disruptions to the security of the nation. People won't remember the Northwest Ordinance Act, um, it follows Shays and the Whiskey Rebellions, which were, of course, rebellions against the federal government. And what did the president at the time do? He created the Northwest Ordinance Act. Nobody remembers it, but among other things, it gave parcels of land to every county in every state in the union at the time. And those parcels of land were to be set aside for public education. And in addition, the Northwest Ordinance Act created funding for building of public schools and funding for teachers. It did other, what we call public works projects. Every state, every county got assistance. You know that as the pork barrel. If you go through every one of these new acts, or then new, the North, the Morrill Act, or what was known as the Land Grant Colleges, during and after the Civil War was an attempt to do what? Give big pork, to everybody in the country and tell them they're all in the same boat. Think about the Highway Trust Fund during the height of the McCarthy period. It was Eisenhower's special project. Many of us joke about it because Eisenhower had been, of course, um, a cavalry and uh, trained also as a um, tank officer. And he was stationed at, at uh, I think, Fort Hood. And he was taking his tanks across county lines and found, my God, the road I was on in Waller isn't continued in Harris. He thought it was important to have a highway act to create an interstate network of highways so people as well as national defense could get around. But what he did was he gave every state, every county, 
every community money to build a, con a, a, a network of connecting roads. People who've written about this point out that it spread money out. Most importantly, it was a way to pull the country together. People who sat in cars now could go from one end of the country to the other end and see places they would never see before. I'll argue that creating big public works projects that give benefits to everybody who need it, whether it's the Clean Water Act, the National Science Foundation, we know about the St. Lawrence Seaway, it did more than just connect um, the Great Lakes, but it was not only a um, seaway expenditure, but it spilled over and, and supported the Highway Trust Fund. If you look at what Biden is doing, he's talking about big spending programs everywhere. In fact, if you go deep into some of his proposals, he's doing exactly what I think the president Trump tried to do when he called Schumer in in 2017 and 18 and talked about a big infrastructure road and highway bill. He was a little bit thwarted by Schumer and even by his own party. But I think in these crises, what you look to do is bind the country together with spending programs that everyone can benefit from. And I know you're going to ask, well, what happened tonight when he was getting rebuffed by even a bipartisan group? I will argue that that's just simply Biden being Biden. He puts on the table much more than he wants to eat and then says, I'll take some of it away. I think he is intentionally looking to see what it is that Republicans really want and what they don't want, he'll take away, um, particularly um, PPE for people whose incomes are over $300,000. Probably not a great idea. So what does Biden's agenda look like? We've seen it already with executive orders, COVID stimulus and vaccination distribution, the economy, climate change, infrastructure, taxes and health and public. If you look at this, most of these programs have broad geographic benefits. And it's gonna be hard for a house member in Iowa, Nebraska and Kansas not to buy into some pieces, I'm sorry, some pieces of this, whether they're roads, um, or for that matter, um, something as simple as healthcare. I know some of you are, you know, thinking, well, they'll never go into healthcare, but look at some of the Republican districts in our own state of Texas, in counties like Collin, Hayes, and Williams. Their commissioners have been um, advocating for uh, the Medicaid extension. Well, a little bit late, but nonetheless, something they want to do. I'm just about done. Um, so what we're looking at 2020. One in 2022, that is, if we're going into the election year, I think you'll see a big move in states like Georgia, Pennsylvania, I'll include in this, our own state of Texas, that will do a massive amount of attempts to reconfigure um, what they'll call election reforms. I, I could talk this about Q&A, but I think the Republicans um, focusing on mail-in voting may be um, badly timed. I just finished a big national um, survey of mail-in voting, and one of the surprises to me was that um, unlike what we anticipated, mail-in voting was not that dominant. The dominant form of voting that really came out and made a big difference for Democrats was convenience voting in the form of in-person early voting, which we've had in Texas since 94, and election day vote centers. Um, that's convenient, that's early voting on election day. I think the Republicans are gonna try to curtail mail-in voting and they may have um, missed what really happened when the governor of Texas extended um, in-person uh, in early voting. And uh, uh, we now have more, I think we have no more over a hundred counties that have election day vote centers. That's what increased turnout. I think you'll see a big effort on this uh, enforcement of voter ID to get um, a mail ballot. I think, I'm not saying it's gonna backfire, but I think oftentimes the Republicans focus on things that don't have any real good evidence and, and science behind them. Um, nevertheless, to the extent that Republicans try to do things that uh, curtail turnout, it's not obvious they'll get a partisan advantage. One of the things that they need to pay attention to is elections are getting very costly. We're spent $22 million more in this November's election, just in Harris County, than we spent in 2016. Now, much of that came from the federal government, but once you add that cost on, voters are gonna expect to see those benefits, whether it's the early voting, drive-through voting, um, drop-off locations. One of the consequences of uh, long lines and waiting times will be lower turnout, but that isn't necessarily uh, a Democratic or Republican phenomenon. I think it's a general phenomenon. Um, 
redistricting. Um, this is probably the sad story for the Democrats. Republicans control 67 of the 99 state legislatures, as they pointed out. They actually picked up one chamber. Redistricting will not be constrained by federal voting rights, not even if the Congress passes that law. Um, the Shelby decision is pretty much in place. Preclearance, many of the things that protected minority rights are gone. The Supreme Court is unlikely to be politically, to, to restrain politically motivated redistricting plans. Not this court, they've made it very clear even before um, their new appointments. I would expect the midterm elections to be tilted heavily in favor of Republicans with one exception. Should Biden's efforts, particularly on the coronavirus and re returning the economy to its healthy state be seen as um, thwarted by Republicans, my sense is that they, they, things could go badly for the Republicans. More than likely, I think it's uh, the case that if we don't get out of this um, uh, virus and return the economy to a healthy state, I think it could be a plague on all incumbents, Democratic and Republican. It doesn't seem that voters will be um, eager to bring back Republicans, but they'll be eager to vote for what I will call candidates who are non-incumbents, which means what? That the fringes will dominate the AOCs and the conservative Tea Party types. Um, let me take a break here and just talk about two things that I thought um, are worth noting here. Um, and I know you have a former Rice student. Um, I did very similar work. I've been looking at the voter file and that's all 18 and a half million registered voters in Texas. And I simply looked at Hispanic surname voters. And I asked a simple question. How many of those voters in 2020 were not even registered to vote in 2016? I then asked a simple question. How did they vote in 2020? And who were they? I didn't survey them. I didn't call them up. I didn't send them a survey. I am just looking at the voter file. I can identify who's Hispanic by their surname. There's always errors there. Many women um, uh, marry Hispanics uh, who are Anglo and uh, may um, not adopt uh, and adopt the, the their, 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 their spouse's surname. But um, my argument is if it's a Hispanic surname that tells you something about identification. I then asked, who are these people that didn't vote and weren't even registered in 216, but voted in 220? They were disproportionately males. They were disproportionately over 45. And over half of them weren't even registered in 218. So I have a group of voters who are males and over 45 who did not register to vote in 216 and of course couldn't vote in 216. Half of them weren't even registered in 218, couldn't have voted, but registered and voted in 220. And how did they vote? Now you're gonna say, how did you figure out how they voted? All I have to do to figure out how they vote is know where they live. When I know where they live, I know what precinct they are. Shockingly, people live in precincts with people like themselves, not just other Hispanics or African-Americans or Jews or Asians or Klingons, but also Republicans. There are 22,000 polling places in this state and you can count literally on toes and hands in each county, how many of them are 50-50 Democrat Republican. The average partisan preference of voters in a precinct in Texas is about 80% Democrat or 80% Republican. So if I have a Hispanic male over the age of 45, not registered, not voting in 18, registered and voting in 2020, I can guess how they voted by knowing where they live. And they voted at about 12 points higher for President Trump than did the same people who voted in 2018 minus the new voters. By this, I infer that new Hispanic voters who've been mobilized by somebody did not vote at the same rate that other Hispanic voters who had previously voted in 2016. And why might that be? It's because I think as new voters, they were not as attentive to the politics of the campaign as habitual Hispanic voters, or for that matter, voters living in the same precincts. And for them, for these males, the economy had been it's really strong and healthy before the pandemic. And that's what they remember. And they remember it associated with President Trump. Exit polls confirm this. 
among new Hispanic voters, male over 45, the two most important issues in the presidential election were the economy and the economy. Immigration and COVID didn't rank one, two, three, four, only fifth and six on their list of important issues. So my, com my comment before, be careful what you wish for. If you turn out more presumably Hispanic voters, do you turn out more Democratic voters? The world's not linear. What you turned out was a group of voters who are still over overwhelmingly likely to vote for the Democratic candidate. But in some counties, in some elections, there were enough of them voting for Trump to tip the down ballot races. Now, this requires a lot more work, but I think this is a case of where um, researchers have assumed that Hispanic voters are uniform, unidimensional. Um, we make these generalizations about South Florida, about Arizona, and what we're beginning to realize is that being Hispanic um, may not necessarily mean the same thing to the people researching as to the people being researched. Sorry to take so long, and I'd be happy to answer questions. No, thank you, Doctor. You, did, you actually have a, well, I guess you, you've been teaching a little while, but you, you hit it almost exactly on the button. Uh, the yeah, question. That last part was a little long. I apologize. No, thank you. Well, you know, I, I, we're, we'll take a look, and I'm, I'm not seeing a, a ton right now, but I do have a question follow-up. If, if, for example, Hispanic Latino voters are not monolithic, how does that work with your assumption that if they live in a certain area, you can kind of figure out which way they vote? Because well, obviously- it's, That's how I figured it out. In those areas where you got a big increase of new Hispanic voters, which were disproportionately male and over 45, those precincts were going for Trump or they were splitting much more narrowly than they did in 2016 for Hillary Clinton. Keep in mind, um, uh, I think I'll help it here, I, I don't remember the number, but in the Valley, um, the, the Democrats lost um, one, of, they did not win a congressional seat um, and um, there were at least two state Senate seats, which they also did not retake in 2020. And in fact, there were some House seats in the Valley they were hoping to pick up. Uh, there was only a net gain of one House seat um, among the Democrats, and they lost one up in the, in the Dallas area for virtually no change. So I think one of the things that um, the Democratic Party and the new party, uh, I think it's Trey, the Congress State, State Representative Trey is in charge of is figuring out what happened with the Hispanic vote. Um, people like myself are doing a big drill down and, and you'll be hearing from your speaker next month. But I think we're finding out that it is a um, community that has diverse interests. Uh, I'll say this, um, it's not a particularly pretty thing to say, but I think Hispanics looked at what the Democratic Party was doing and wondering, what about Hispanic lives? What about Hispanic voters? Um, the Democratic Party, has been in, in, in the eyes of many Hispanics captured by African-Americans. Um, and uh, I could talk about this in Harris County at length. Frank Ali, the late county commissioner, I was in charge of redistricting with two of my colleagues in 2010 for the county. And Franco refused to give up votes and precincts that might have helped elect an Hispanic. It did eventually get Sylvia elected, Garcia, but it didn't obviously hold up very well by 2014. She was, um, excuse me, 2010, knocked off by uh, the, Mr. Mormon. Now, I think the, the Hispanic voter was looking and wondering, do I really have a home in the Democratic Party? That's clearly what happened in South Florida. But of course, that's, you know, what we call Central Americans, Cuban Americans, Venezuelans, Nicaraguans. But you go over to, of course, um, Arizona, and you get an entirely different population of Hispanics. I think in Texas, what you got are, Tejano, you got, you got Hispanics who have longer histories here than any of us who are natives. And they don't see themselves as a distinct minority. They see themselves as true Texans. And when they see people coming across the border, taking jobs from them, or wondering about what or not, what, why are blacks getting preferential treatment and not Hispanics for college admission, jobs, they start wondering whether they're in the right party. And that doesn't even touch on issues like same-sex marriage, abortion, school choice. Uh, Karl Rove wrote us that the Republican Party was a place where Hispanics could have been wooed. But for some odd reasons, um, Republicans over the last 10 years have run away from that. But I think you're seeing this um, 
in, in, in the policies that the Republican Party has been following, look at how many Democrats of Hispanic surname Democratic office holders, particularly judicial candidates, have flipped over. The Republicans have gone to some judicial candidates and said, we'll give you an open seat if you just run as a Republican. And they have. In fact, up until recently, more Republicans of Hispanic persuasion were in the House delegation of Texas than Democrats. Well, so so that's that's always something that's been interesting to me in the difference between opinions and data. I mean, one of our one of our attendees was raising the issue, okay, what about the indications that there's an age massive differential between Hispanic voters or Latino voters and, nope. and older, you know, how do, how do you tease it out? And what's the way to kind of figure out, for example, is it, is it they were uncomfortable with Kamala Harris as a candidate or, or that's the issue? How do you tease that out in a metric data issue as opposed to just, this is what I think? I, I think what we're seeing with older Hispanic voters who had been in the electorate a long time, a much higher percent of democratic support but you saw a very low number of Hispanic voters. So the way to think about it is this, would you rather win 75% of 100 or 60% of 10,000? And obviously you want 60% of 10,000, 60% of 10,000, 6,000 votes, 75% of even a thousand votes is only 750. So if you remember your math, you increase the base, that has no limit. It's, it's infinite. The rate at which people vote for a Democrat or Republican candidate has, an, has a top. It can only go up to 100%. So the interesting question is, as you increase the size of the Hispanic electorate, you bring in more people. And disproportionately, what was coming into the electorate in the past were younger voters. And they were decidedly more open to splitting their ticket and decidedly more open to voting for candidates that were Republicans. Now what we saw was a big increase in older male Hispanic voters. So what I'm getting at is age, gender, occupation. This is not a monolithic group and we need to drill down and look at it. My suspicions are, look at the race between Michael Moore and Mr. Ramsey for commissioner court number, help me two, the Steve Raddick seat, or was it one? I can't remember. Or never three. Only like four of them. So I was, we, running, out of, I was running out of guesses. What was interesting in that race is that the Democratic presidential candidate in the district did better than Michael Moore. So there was a lot of down ballot ticket splitting. And I'm arguing that there were people in that district and it's one of the fastest growing middle-class Hispanic districts that might have felt better about voting for a Democrat at the top of the ticket and then came back and voted for a guy like Ramsey, not because he was a Republican. One argument could be made that he had been the mayor of a Valley, is it Valley, not Valley Stream, I can't remember the- Spring Valley. Um, the Valley. Was it in Spring Valley, was it? Or Spring what? Valley, thank you, Spring Valley. And he'd been in there a long time. He's no kid. I mean, I think he's in his late 60s, early 70s. And he wasn't extremely partisan. He said, you know, there's no Republican or Democratic way to pick up garbage. Whereas Michael Moore had worked for a former mayor, but never held elective office. What I'm getting at is that elections can become much more complicated when they get very close and you are, it is dangerous to try to generalize and say, just because you have an Hispanic surname, you'll be voting Democratic. And I think when you give voters those kinds of choices, you inevitably find that it doesn't always turn out the way you would, you would, you know, partisanship is important. It's just that what I'm noticing in Texas is a lot more ticket splitting. And it came from actually more Republicans than Democrats. Um, but it nonetheless was created a, what I would call for the Democrats, a sense of we just can't count on having um, everybody vote straight ticket. Now they did get rid of straight ticket voting. That will be something we'll also look at and whether it made a difference. Okay, and that actually, that's somebody kind of predicated that. My guess is at this point, the data is still out on the straight ticket voting. Or I you don't, any data yet? these are all the issues in my, that I'm, a, I'm a, like on Busman's holiday. I have no less than I think three NSF grants and. I've been working on all these questions that that's one I've wanted to work on for a while. It's not hard, but it's just, it's, it's a lot of data work. Um, the data statewide is not in, so I've been doing some of the Metroplexes. 
Um, my, my sense is that straight ticket voting, its removal, didn't make that much of a difference. Um, why? The big difference with straight ticket voting is it enhances the speed with which people can vote, which means what? That lines are shorter, and waiting times are shorter. So one of the things we know in states which have straight ticket voting is that not only do people not wait in line longer, but they don't walk away from lines. Lines don't look long when they come to vote. This year, because of COVID, what we found was we doubled, in some cases, tripled the number of polling locations, number of polling days, and number of polling hours. There were no long lines. I have all the data on how long lines were at something like, I don't know, help me here, 1,500 polling locations over 23 days and uh, 150 hours of voting. There was never more than about 11 minute average waiting time from when you got in line to when you finished checking. So that meant what? That the time you spent waiting in line, checking in was saved on voting. And what we see in the ballot is an unusually low drop off. You know what I mean by that? That is the number of votes cast for president is about equal to the number of votes cast for the last race on what is in this country, the longest ballot in the country. Harris County has, and, and most Texas counties have the longest ballot of all counties in the US, mostly because we vote for judges. So we had the confluence of a lot of things. COVID drove up the need for having more voting places, more voting days, more voting hours. That reduced the demand for long lines, waiting times. That gave voters more time. And on top of which, this was a consequential election, which everybody turned out and probably walked in with what they call cheat sheets. And they, they knew who they were going to vote for. But again, um, that's based on some previous research I've done, and I'm going to try to replicate it and see if it's true again. Well, I can tell you for many of our listeners in the judiciary, the undervote is something they live or die for. They, they actually pay attention to that quite a bit oh, yeah. uh, uh, on that. And, 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 you know, that's one of the things that, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and chip in. You, you probably didn't hear us, but we had Chris Hollins and, and uh, Constable uh, were in talking about, as well as terror work. I mean, it wasn't just COVID that led to an increased accessibility for voting. There, there was some intentionality and, and a lot oh. of resources put into it uh, on there. And uh, I, I worked for the county for three years designing early voting locations for, 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 for Diane Strout, uh, Troutman and then later on for uh, Michael Wynn. And of course, my, um, there's no question. Harris County is ground zero for some of the finest election administration in the country. And don't take my word for it. I know guys who spend their lives studying this and everybody was coming here to see what they've done. Um, the Players Association of the NBA is about to uh, put out solicitations for grants to study voting at sports stadium because in places like Atlanta at the Hawks Stadium, 80,000 votes were cast there in the runoff election for the two Senate seats. Um, it was, there were some unusual efforts, 11,200 plus men and women worked the polls. It's almost a 40% increase. And almost all of them were newly trained and clearly younger people because older people were afraid to go to work the polls for fear of COVID. No, I think there was a lot there, but COVID was a driving force behind that. Um, when I started working with um, even Troutman before she took ill with her and had to resign, um, we were polling voters about their desire to drive through and all these other, I remember having the drive through polling results and Diane was looking at me and said, how are we going to ever do that? When Chris came in, he and uh, Ben Chow, another Rice graduate, um, made it happen, birthed in the primary runoff election in July and then did a spectacular job until, of course, the governor and the attorney general tried to intervene, um, but drive through voting was allowed um, and, and they counted those ballots. And I, I want to say about 18,000 people used that um, venue. So no, it was, a, I think, I'll go so far as to say it was a spectacular election that nationwide. Um, I just finished about a survey of 17,000 people in all 50 states. Um, and I was stunned at the results, particularly about mail-in voting. And I might note here, um, the voting experiences of Republicans and Democrats were indistinguishable in its high quality, high quality. So however much Republicans think the election was stolen, when you ask them, it's, it's really a disconnect. You bring me back, I'll show you the results. So we asked the same voter, what do you think about voter fraud? And they said, well, you know, of course, Republicans said it was there and Democrats, nothing, right? But when I asked a voter, the same voter, tell me about your voting experience. They were uniformly praising of their voting experience. Republicans, Democrats, 
Republicans voted by mail, voted in person, Democrats the same way. So there's a big disconnect between the experiences of voters and of course the echo chamber that they hear, whether it's from the president or Rudy Giuliani. And that I think is the opening for having a conversation. What I often do with people when they tell me Republicans, and I know a lot of them, that there's a stolen election, I say, but what about your voting experience here in Texas? Oh, uh, this is, you know, State Senator Betancourt. I had a wonderful experience. So no fraud in Texas. Oh, no, 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 we, we don't do that. Well, what about in Pennsylvania? Oh, it's terrible. Well, do you know anybody that voted in Pennsylvania? Have you ever been in Pennsylvania? I don't think Paul, I asked Paul that once. I don't think he's ever, I don't think he would be able to find it. On, I'm sure he'd find it on a map, but I don't think he knows where Pennsylvania is. Well, you know, you know, the parallel to that is, uh, you know, lawyers get a really bad name, but generally speaking, most folks like their lawyer. Well, it, it, this isn't even about their own. I, I know Republicans in Pennsylvania in my survey who are absolutely convinced. I didn't ask him about, I didn't ask an Allegheny, uh, Pittsburgh County voter about fraud in Philadelphia. I said, how about here in Allegheny County? Oh yeah, they're all cheating. Well, what about your vote? Oh no, no, I'm, you know. I think it's what we say and what we do. We often do things at variance with what we say and vice versa. And I think this is the problem. People when confronting the reality of the situation say, mm. I asked people, did they actually observe any fraud? And that was, we rotate the question so I can get it before and after. People who are convinced there is fraud never see it. Of course, the, the thinking is more like angels, you know, you, you have to be dead to see them. So we know they exist, but just, we can't really see them. Just like other conspiracy theories. So, so to change, because obviously I don't want to give away, and, and, and by the way, thank you, Andrew and the Braves Democrats for, for letting us join in on this, but, and we will, you're more than welcome to hear Dr. Bollies, and I hope you do join us on February 4th. Uh, but, but to kind of switch gears a little bit, it sounds like you've had some chance to go through the data on at least the, the Harris County Metropolitan, maybe the, the Metroplex. What have you seen in the data so far for Asian American, South Asian voters, and where have they been? And, and the role and where have they been in terms of party affiliation or at least voting affiliation? Um, they were they were moving and did move more heavily towards um, Democrats, um, the largest. So again, it's not a monolithic group. You have um, uh, in, in this county, probably three distinct groups, um, Pakistani and Indian, um, Vietnamese, which came over in the late 70s, early 80s, at the end of the Vietnam War and then a large um, uh, Chinese mainland and, and, and Chinese uh, Taiwan. Um, Chinese Americans and Taiwanese split more evenly. They've been moving Democratic. Vietnamese um, decidedly more Republican, but again, also split. Um, the one that is decidedly Democratic are Pakistanis, East Asians. Um, some of that ends up being less about um, nationality and, and more about class. So what you start seeing in these Asian communities is distinctively different educational backgrounds, origins, and occupations. So when you find people who are professionals in India coming to the United States as petrochemical engineers, doctors, lawyers, living down in, uh, you know, um, uh, Brazoria, Galveston, uh, Pearland area, voting Democratic heavily. What they did was they came into a small rural community that was overwhelmingly white and of course occupied um, and, and, and replaced mostly Republican voters. But the Asian Pacific Americans decidedly moving, and not overwhelming, but moving towards um, the Democratic Party. The issue there has often been immigration and, and, and so the president, President Trump's rhetoric. In the black community, it's a declining electorate. Um, there was never really any replacement in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and in terms of births, the uh, birth rates were almost barely replacement. Large, largely due to incarceration of males, um, probably the largest population of male incarcerated um, people are of color um, and particularly black. Um, women are still at least 55 and probably in some um, local races, mayor's races, 65% of the black electorate. So they're decidedly older, they're decidedly, of course, female um, and, um, and very liberal democratic. Um, when you increase that black voter turnout with males, you start seeing more and more of them voting like male Hispanics, older male Hispanics voting um, for Republican candidates, sometimes because simply of the, um, how can I put this indelicately, the racial rhetoric. And some of it is also gender-based. Um, 
the thing about the down ballot voting, I'll just say you touched on, I was expecting to see more roll off because of the non-ticket split without the straight ticket button. Didn't happen. Um, the rate at which people rolled off was not statistically significantly different by precinct than the 216 election. Now the number, the number was, but that's simply because we had more votes, right? So to make the two elections look alike, I just look at the percent. Um, I'm now looking more carefully at where that roll off occurred because sometimes a roll off can occur when there isn't much on the down ballot. By that I mean, there weren't contested races for state house, state senate, congressional, and even lower um, for some partisan races that might have been on the ballot. Um, but what I'm concerned about at this point is whether or not that was because of the peculiarities of this election having to do with COVID and the extraordinary efforts, not just here in Harris County, but throughout the state to make voting, um, if not safer, also more convenient. Um, I don't know if we can expect that going forward in 2022 and 2024, when hopefully by then COVID is off the table and the Republicans have instituted some more draconian efforts on restricting voters. So, Doctor, uh, there is one, actually, I'm going to want to take a little bit of privilege. There's one question that Jerry Bernberg, a former party chair, had that I think, at least if you want to take a crack at, uh, do you have a prediction, and this is a data-free, so nobody's going to hold you to it, about how the impeachment proceedings may impact perspectives on both parties, or you're like, like a lot of folks, who knows? I don't think it's going to be good. I, um, I, I'll be blunt about it. I was not an advocate for impeaching the president. Not that I don't think he should be impeached and probably worse. Um, not that what he did was an insurrection, but principle and practicality. The trade-off here is that this country is badly split, terribly um, threatened, not only by COVID, but by everything that comes with COVID. An economy that can't get on. I think our, the threat is as much domestic as it is foreign. Um, I think impeaching the president and preventing him from running, um, which is really what um, is at the heart of this, is a luxury and a gift to the Republicans. My view was, you know, censure him, both in the House and the Senate, and then let the Republicans deal with him. It's not our problem. It's their problem. Our problem is to get this President Biden to a point where he can produce vaccines, get it in the arms of people, get people back into school, back to work, and recover the economy. That is what we need. I think what the Republicans, Hawley, Cruz, and others are going to do is use the impeachment as a way to turn it on, on, on the Democrats for um, and, and, and slow down um, confirmation and slow down consideration. Now, Biden, I think, has, I think people, many of you probably read Doris Kearns' book, um, Team of Rivals. Biden is just like Lincoln. I don't want to compare him to Lincoln, and I, I'm a big fan of Lincoln. But Biden comes in doing what? Appointing his most ardent opponent, who called him a racist in the first debate as his vice presidential candidate and now vice president. Half the people he's put into his cabinet are people he ran against. Who did that in 1861? Lincoln. Who thought that Lincoln was utterly a boob and couldn't govern most of his opponents? And how did Lincoln come into his inauguration? with the Pinkertons on a train into Baltimore as a secret. No, I, I think what, what's, what's going for Biden is that he, there isn't a high expectation, even among Republicans. Forget about the Democrats. I mean, the Democrats, I think, have to live with him. But I think there were, I think Mitch McConnell and he have something they have very much in common. And it isn't that they're two old white men, you know, who've been around a long time. It's that they care about the institution and neither of them is going to be around for the, the second round. So I'm rooting, um, but I don't think impeachment helps. I think of the quicker week, I'm glad it's one article. I'm glad that they postponed it to help me here the 8th of February. I think that's the right date. And I hope it goes quickly. Um, and if I think it um, has any impact, it'll, um, I just simply hope it puts a lodestone around the Republican party, uh, causing Hawley and Cruz and everybody who wants to be a junior Donald Trump having to, to you know, to pander to the, you know, Proud Boys, Tea Party, QAnon, um, we don't need to, to clean their house. And that's what we're doing. And I think, I know Schumer and others, well, in the house, it was, it was I mean, there was outrage. Um, but, and they had some Republicans, but I don't think it's going to help them. So um, you're, you're in the, the pragmatism over principle uh, box? Yeah, I mean, principle's nice, but people are dying. Right. People are dying. 
there are consequences to your principle. Not indicting and trying a sitting, a non-sitting president doesn't seem to me such a, I mean, a compromise to my principles. You know, not telling my wife that I, um, I crashed on my bike is a principled deception that can do harm. I think trying President Trump for what we all know are egregious and increasingly egregious mistakes. You know where I think the real outcome will be? It's that group of men and women who have to decide whether he gets back on Facebook and Twitter. That is consequential. That makes a difference. And you know, they have that super court now that uh, that Facebook has, New York Times in an article about that. They have this special celebrity court that's gonna right. make the decision, so. Yeah, no, and some of them include non-Americans. I think that, and I must say for lawyers, I'm sure all of you, I'm no lawyer, but I, I, I have great reservations about corporate, but this is exactly what happened in, when, 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 when Teddy Roosevelt took the presidency, he took on the trust. This country was run by four, five, six big industrial empires, oil, railroads, energy, you know, the Dole Fruit Company, the Banana Company. And, and Trump, excuse me, Trump, Teddy Roosevelt took him on. A Republican, I might note, the great progressive. His only foolishness was promising he wouldn't run for a second term and being friends with Taft. Um, but the truth of the matter is, you know, we are in the same pickle. And I think, you know, indulging in um, this type of, I call it principle, but indulging in it comes at a great expense. And as much as we can point a finger at Trump for his bad administering of fighting the COVID, I think it's possible, I hope not, that there will be people who've done this uh, trial and they'll have to answer for it. Well, thank you, Doctor uh, Andrew. My pleasure. Thank you for putting thank up with me. Much for, for your time, and, and I, I, we didn't get all the questions, but we got about eighty percent of them, which is our choice of principle over pragmatism or vice versa, maybe. But thank you so much for doing this, and thank right. you, Andrew, so much for letting us do this. This is available if you want to share it on the Facebook page. Uh, I don't know whether your students want to see you live or in person, Doctor. But I have enough of it. <laughs> Thank well, you so thank much. You. I hope to see you all again on February 4 with uh, Dr. Bali, who really do a deep dive into her research already on what happened down in the valley. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night, everyone.